the strikes question I've got for you is this. Do you remember when P&Q fired their entire workforce and replaced them with agency staff? And briefly, the political establishment, and indeed most media, I think, although I'd have to double-check, and frankly, life's too short, the political establishment and most media were united in their condemnation of P&O. And, 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 and there were threats. Grant Shapps was going to do such things. What they were, he knew not, but they would be the terror of the earth. Grant Shapps absolutely adamant and uh, that this was an outrage and that they were thinking of changing the law to prevent it from happening again and that it was a, an assault upon um, the, the, the dignity of the British workforce, ordinary British working people who they always stick up for, you remember that? And then it sort of just went away again. And P&O's ships, as far as I'm aware, are now crewed by agency staff who were brought in to replace people on the payroll. Now, they had a, a decent-ish... Um, uh, remuneration package, compensation package, the people that were got rid of, but they didn't want to be got rid of. And, and the political and media establishment united to condemn those moves. Which makes it all the stranger that yesterday Grant Shapps insisted that ministers will put agency workers on the railways if strikes persist. So I think this works. P&O workers didn't have the opportunity to take industrial action to protest against having their terms and conditions torn up and thrown into the River Humber because they were blindsided and taken by surprise. And Grant Shapps was on their side, briefly. But railway workers who are concerned about an assault upon their terms and conditions and are keen to protect their pay packets, they're going to be replaced by agency workers, says the same Grant Shapps. And unfortunately for Grant, at this stage in his career, he can't use made-up names to flog dodgy, get-rich-quick schemes on the internet. He has to call himself Grant Shapps every day. He can't be Sebastian Fox on Fridays, Grant Shapps on Mondays, and Michael Green on Wednesdays, which is, seriously, you think I'm exaggerating, that's how he spent a significant part of his pre- and indeed post-political career. I can't quite get my head around that. How can bringing in agency workers to replace P&O staff be an appalling affront to the dignity of British workers in the mind of someone who's threatening to bring in agency staff to replace British workers on the railways who have the audacity to suggest that they're going to take collective action to protect themselves from what they describe, and we'll examine this morning whether or not this description is fair or accurate or, or, or neither, they describe as an unconscionable assault upon their terms and conditions. And here's the bit I really don't get. And I suspect that my privilege is part of the problem here. The bit I really don't get is the envy. How you can be so easily persuaded to um, hate on someone protecting their terms and conditions because their terms and conditions are better than yours, instead of hating whatever it was that took yours away and not just diminished your terms and conditions, but also diminished your ability to protest against that diminishment. Uh, in other words, the post-1979 settlement that stripped trade unions bare in almost all sectors, and the ones that still offer a degree of support to their um, members are public enemy number one in the Daily Mail and the Rupert Murdoch-owned media. And it's lazy and it's gross because what is left if you have no protection. Zero hour contracts. That's what's left. Ghost economies where you only get to work after turning up if they need you, where they send you home if they don't need you, where you have to put your hand up to ask for permission to go to the toilet, where you don't know from one week to the next whether you're going to have a job next month. That is what these people dream of. I'm not making that up. Dominic Raab and Priti Patel and Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng and Chris Skidmore wrote a bloody book about it. That is what they dream of. So here's the question for you this morning. You can either do it from the outside, trying to analyse other people, or you can do it from the inside, telling me why you are part of this problem. How come it is so easy to persuade working British people to attack other working British people when they decide to stick up for themselves. And obviously the only way in which they can stick up for themselves meaningfully is by inconveniencing the rest of us. I, well, I'm very conscious of my age this morning because I used to say on the radio, I might need people who are older than me to explain this, but I'm 50 now. And obviously there are still an awful lot of people older than me, but 
not as many as there were when I started in this job all those moons ago. But I, I don't have the palette of memory to remember whether or not this is a relatively new phenomenon, whether or not actually in the 1950s and the 1960s industrial action was widely understood to be a last resort for workers against the owning classes. I don't know, but that's the question I've got for you. Why is it so easy in 21st century Britain to turn worker against worker when the worker who still has the right to protect him or herself from uh, a, a, an employer dares to exercise it? Why aren't we all on the same side? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. And, and that, I think, is one of the most important questions that society ever asks itself. And I can't imagine things being much uglier on this particular issue than they are in the society we inhabit. Because if they can turn you against railway workers, they can turn you against doctors. How do I know that? Because they already did.